Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm working on my locomotive this week, and I'm going to make the link brackets. These are the support structure for the entire rear half of the valve gear, and I think they really tie the room together. So let's go. When last we left our valve gear, we had the expansion link finished, that complex assembly that threads over the radius arm and allows us to adjust the valve gear hookup. Now we need the link bracket, shown here in green. This allows the expansion link to pivot back and forth as the valve gear cycles and ties everything to the motion bracket, effectively fixing the rear end of all the valve gear in place. I think it also really ties the room together. Here is Kozo's drawing of this bracket from the book. We actually need four of them because there's one on each side of each expansion link. You'll notice that it's a simple hole in the end of that, and the pin from the center of the expansion link sits in that hole. I'm actually going to make a little bit of an improvement here, as you'll see in a second. To get started, I have this very convenient piece of 4140 that's already been normalized and has been machined to the thickness of the link brackets. This is not an accident. There's a lot of the valve gear that's all kind of this same thickness. And so I have some offcuts and a couple of extra pieces from scrapped parts from the side rods and similar sorts of exciting failures. But the great thing is, and nothing will go to waste. I have found the front corner of that part, and the first operation is to side mill in a filleted profile on the front edge of this piece. I'm going to define the ends of this profile cut with a couple of plunge milling operations at each end to create the fillets, rather than trying to side mill all of this out in one go. Or at least I would, except that setup was chattering terribly. <laughs> I was afraid of that because the piece is sticking up pretty high out of the vise, as is required to get the depth we need. So I'm going to try stiffening it up with a piece of scrap clamped to the back of it. We'll see if this helps. If not, I'm going to have to do a completely different setup. But in fact, that combined with a little bit lighter cut did the trick. The reason for plunge milling both ends of this filleted area is that it's much easier to cut this way for a feature that's fully 90 degrees around the circumference of an end mill. You might be tempted to push the end mill into the work sideways and then cut across to do a feature like this. That really doesn't work very well because, first of all, you're asking a lot of an end mill to push into the work laterally. That doesn't work very well. Secondly, when you side mill your way to the other end, you're side milling into a corner. And that also does not work well because as the end mill engages with the corner and becomes fully engaged in a 90 degree arc around the outside of the end mill, it's just too much engagement for it to cut effectively and you will get chatter. However, by plunging the fillets at either end, that's a much easier cut for the end mill because it's only cutting on the end and it gives you like a starting and ending place that's out of contact with the material to then come back in and do your side milling. In addition, I've done the side milling by roughing it in in two sections. I did the top half first and then the lower half. In both cases, I'm stopping a little bit short of final depth. And then I come back and do one final light cut all the way from one end to the other to unify the surface and leave a nice finish all the way across. That was a little bit of a tricky cut, but not too bad. It's the kind of cut that really benefits from planning your milling strategy a little bit. The most obvious way to go in and cut something is not always the best way. You'll end up with chatter and other cutting difficulties, but that approach of plunging the ends and then side milling in a couple of stages worked really well. Now that is two of the link brackets, and of course I need four, so I did another piece of scrap the same way. So there's all four brackets still encased in their host material, but now I can start cutting off that excess material. Start by lopping off the ends on the bandsaw. The extra length on them was just there because that's how long the pieces of scrap were, no other reason. And then I'm also going to cut off that excess at the bottom that was there in order to hold the piece in the vise for that side milling. For both of these cuts, I'm staying well outside the final dimension of the parts because I need to finish up to final dimension with milling, of course. So over to the vise to do that now. I'm going to mill down that long bandsaw cut to final width. You might think I could just mill this down until that center section goes away, but in fact that would not work. You would end up cutting too deeply if you did that. This is again a little bit of a tricky thing to know about milling. When you start milling into a very thin piece of material like that, what happens is the material, when it gets very thin, like tissue paper thin, it just starts deflecting away from the cutter and it doesn't actually get cut. Now, eventually it will cut if you really keep pushing down and down and down with the cutter. However, by the time it's done that, you're too deep already. 
To prevent that, the way I'm measuring my depth and final width on this part is by measuring the ends of the piece. So after an initial cut, I've taken it out of the vise, measured the dimension at the ends, figured out how much further I need to go, then put it back in the vise and finish that cut. And now you can see the piece still has this tissue paper piece of metal hanging off the end of it, but the piece is at final dimension even though it looks like there's still a little bit more to remove because that little piece of scrap is still there. But that comes off with a deburring tool. You can see how thin it actually was, and that was never going to get cut. That was just going to get pushed away from the end mill forever until I was 10 thousandths under size or something. But as you can see by measuring from the ends, I'm dead nuts on 656, which is what this needs to be. Quality result there. Now I'll clean up the ends where that bandsaw cut was and bring these to final dimension. In this case, I'm measuring the overall dimension of the assembly. Remember, this is two parts but I can deduce that the base at the end of one part is the correct thickness by measuring the overall assembly and knowing how much space I've left between the parts in the middle. Because the top of the base is a fillet, I can't really measure accurately off of that with the micrometer, so I'm measuring the overall length and subtracting everything above the base that I'm trying to hit a dimension with. Next up are the important features of these, which is the holes that actually form the pivots. The way I'm doing this is by edge finding on one end on the absolute scale on my DRO and the edge finding on the other end with the incremental scale in my DRO. And that will give me a zero on each part that's accurate for that part and doesn't risk any error created by translating from one end of one part in the assembly because these are two parts end to end stuck together, if that makes sense. So each part is having its hole positioned relative to its own critical reference, which is the distance from the bottom surface of the bracket to the center of these holes. These holes both get center drilled, drilled, and reamed to final dimension, which for me is larger than what's in the drawing. You'll see why in a moment, although I'm sure you've already guessed why. But you can see how that little trickery with the two scales on the DRO saved me a lot of tool changing time. And I can save a little more tool changing time by using an end stop and swapping in the other blank with the other two link brackets on it. Now then, over to the lathe with a piece of bronze, and that is because I'm going to add a bearing to these brackets. As drawn, the brackets are mild steel with a hole in them, and then the expansion links are a mild steel pin that has been silver soldered into the trunnion plates. Now, mild steel on mild steel is not a great friction pair. I mean, it's probably fine because Kozo has designed it this way. There are lots of these locomotives that have been built and run very well for many years, so I'm sure it's fine. But it was bothering me. Like I said, mild steel on mild steel, not a great friction pair. And it was very simple to modify this part to add a bearing interface here. There's nothing near the brackets at the end that would interfere if I enlarge the end of this bracket a little bit, which allows me to make the hole a little bit bigger to fit a bronze bearing in there. So that's what I'm doing and making this little bronze bearing. I've turned the OD to a little bit larger than final dimension. And now I'm going to pause on the turning, center drill, drill, and ream the center out. I'm doing this before hitting final dimension on the OD because on a really thin walled part like this, operations on the inside of it can cause the part to stretch and cause you to blow your outside dimension. So it's good to do the interior features first and then do the exterior at the end. However, once the part has been bored out in the center, it is going to be thin walled and possibly not strong enough for heavy turning operations. So that's why I don't do the interior features first and then do all of the turning. <laughs> that's why I get close to final dimension and then do the interior and then just have a light cut to bring it to final dimension. That should give me a very nice running fit on that pin for the expansion link and indeed it does. So I think we have succeeded in making a bearing. Now, as I said, I'm turning the OD with, again, a very light cut because the piece is now thin walled. I know it's hard to tell on camera, but the wall of this final bearing is just 31 thousandths, so it doesn't have a lot of strength to hold up to heavy OD turning cuts at this point. But I turn that down to a nice fit on the link brackets. Eh, it's a few tenths looser than I would have liked, but that's okay. It's going to get Loctited in anyway. Now I can start parting off bearings. I, of course, need four of these, one for each link bracket. And I couldn't quite get all four out of one setup. I managed to get three, so I'm going to have to do the fourth one in a separate setup. But as I go down, I'm translating down the width of the bearing plus the width of the parting blade. 
In between each one, I'm chamfering both corners and deburring the center as well. And yahtzee, yahtzee, yahtzee. You know how it goes. Back to my steel blanks. I'm going to do a little bit of layout on these. We're now focused on the outside shape of them, which is all aesthetic. So a little bit of hand layout is going to be just fine. It's time to split them apart, which I'll do on the bandsaw. I've left myself generously more than the width of the bandsaw blade between the parts, so I won't have any trouble cutting them apart. While they're in this stage, I'm going to do the threaded holes in the bottom, which actually mount them to the motion bracket. I'm using the end of the fixed jaw as a square reference and a repeatability reference so that I can quickly iterate through all eight of these little threaded holes. And these are all getting taper tapped and bottom tapped because these are not very deep. With these little model parts, every thread counts. There are a lot of components on this locomotive that only have two and a half or three threads in a blind hole holding something to something else. These parts are all very cramped for space and there's no room left over for generous thread depths. Okay, over to the surface plate, I'm going to locate the center of the hole using a gauge pin and a little bit of math. And then from there, I can offset and find the tangent points around that circle where the angled sides of the link brackets are going to meet it. This goes really quickly after initial setup because the parts are symmetrical across their long axis, and of course all four are identical. Here you can see those critical tangent points on either side of the bore, and oh also they're marked on the other side, because I had to do all this again because I realized I actually need them marked on the back so that I can finish the layout by hand in a setup like this. These angled sides are just decorative, so my angle is a little bit different than it is in the drawing because, as I said, I've enlarged that hole at the end a little bit to make room for the bearing. Now the center position of the hole relative to the base is still the same as the drawing. That's, of course, a critical dimension. I've just enlarged the tapered end of it a little bit. I'm setting each of these up in the vise with a little bit of a packing block behind them to account for the flange and I've aligned them with a parallel on the top of the jaw so that that layout line is parallel to the mill, and now I just have to cut down to my layout line. I'm actually not cutting to the layout line, I'm cutting down to the point where the angled surface meets the base of the piece at a sharp corner. And you can actually see on the surface of the material where you've milled and where you haven't because the tool marks are different, so you know when you've touched that corner. When you get close to the end, you just take really light cuts, go a little bit at a time, until that surface just meets the mating one on a sharp corner and you know your depth is correct. That's going to be more accurate than trusting your layout lines. Of course you could do all the math and stuff to figure out exactly what this angle is and exactly how deep to go from a perfect touch off and so on, but honestly by the time you do all of that math you can just mill to a layout line and these are decorative features so it doesn't really matter. As long as it looks good it's right. With all of the taper cuts done that same way, now I can go over to my end rounding fixture on my belt sander to round the ends. This is a perfect job for this fixture because the sides of these parts are straight, so it's a simple matter of rotating the piece around that reference bore in the center, feeding in a little bit at a time on the dovetail fixture until the rounded end meets up cleanly with both sides with no visible tangent point transition between the straight section and the rounded end. And again, you could do this on a rotary table with a lot of math, but it's honestly just not necessary because this is all aesthetic. And again, in the time it takes you to set up the rotary table, you could have already done this on the belt sander. This fixture I've been very pleased with. It works really, really very well. I'm very glad I built this thing for the locomotive because it really speeds up this type of feature. 99.9% .9 of the end roundings on this locomotive and probably on most things in this world are aesthetic. So they don't have to be micron perfect. It's just not worth doing all the math to do this kind of feature. Once all the ends were rounded, then I removed the layout die and cleaned things up a little bit with some scotch brite, removed tool marks and so on, give everything a nice sheen. And now it's time to Loctite in all of these teeny tiny bearings. Put a little drop of Loctite 680 on each one. 680 is the permanent retaining compound for slip fits, so this will work up to well, one or two thousandths of clearance. If it's a closer fit than that, like a half thou down to an interference fit, then you use Loctite 604, which is the same compound but for tighter fits. Essentially, it's just a less viscous version of the same substance. Once that Loctite is cured, we can go see if they fit on the locomotive. 
This is a bit of a tense moment because we're bringing together a lot of components that haven't been attached in any significant way before. So we're resolving a lot of constraints suddenly in the drawings. If things aren't all just right somewhere, we're about to find out. In addition, with all of these mild steel parts, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I coat them in oil just to keep them from rusting over the years that this thing is sitting on my bench while I build all of the components. Once the locomotive is running, then it's going to be self-oiling to a substantial degree. I'm also putting oil on the pins and so on to make sure everything's at least got some oil in it for initial test running when that day comes, in case I forget to oil things later. With the inner bracket on and the expansion link installed, now I can push the outer bracket on. So far so good, things seem to be fitting. Here's a little trick I've learned for assembling these complex components. After tightening everything down initially, things might be stiff, things might not be moving as loosely as you think they should. So rather than getting out the files and the sandpaper, try just loosening the screws off a little bit and then while the screws are a little bit loose, work the mechanism through its range of motion and then gradually tighten the screws in a sequential order. And what this will do is give everything a chance to kind of settle into where it wants to be to run through its motion. There's enough clearance in all the bolt holes and such that there's probably a position that the mechanism does work smoothly in. You just have to let it find it while the bolts are loose. Gradually tightening them while cycling the mechanism really helps a lot. I've saved myself a lot of sanding and filing by doing that. And that's now moving really, really beautifully in there. Very, very pleased with that. I was nervous about these. There's a lot of things that could have gone wrong with the fit and fit up of this whole assembly now that everything is connected, but that has gone really well, and I think they really tie the room together. The addition of those bearings in the end I think was definitely worth doing. It really wasn't very difficult. It was a very minor change to the drawings, and making those little bearings only took 20 minutes, so definitely think that was worth doing. It looks nice, it should run better, and I think it really ties the room together. I hope you enjoyed the making of these link brackets. Once again, all the brass screws that you see are temporary. They will be steel in the final assembly, but I have to order a bunch of tiny steel screws. Well, thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all this happen, and I'll see you next time. Yeah, I really think that ties the room together.